Welcome back. Sonia Khan had left her abusive husband and was about to move from Chicago to Chattanooga, starting a newly single life and posting about her journey literally and figurat figuratively uh, on TikTok all along the way. And she had a lot of help from her friends who supported her throughout this entire ordeal until two weeks ago. when Khan was found dead in her Chicago apartment, shot to death by her ex-husband. Her friend Gabriella was about to join her for, for the trip to Chattanooga uh, when that dreaded phone call came. Uh, and Gabriella Bordeaux uh, joins us now. Thank you so much for being here, Gabriella. I know um, this is still very, very raw and it can't, it can't be easy to talk about um, because I, I know this is, this is one of your best friends. She is, yeah. What was, what was Sonia like? How, I mean, she just looks so vibrant in the videos. How would you describe her? She was like a thunderstorm. So powerful and fun and direct and bold and effervescent. She was my mirror and I love her. She's absolutely exquisite and so much fun. Yeah, those are amazing photos of, of the both of you. I know that she was closing out one chapter of her life, at least hoping to end her marriage. Um, and she was gonna move and, and try to get away. And you were actually, you were, you were planning to help her, right? I was, I'm also her roommate. So I went up to see her and bring her home. And how much was she looking forward to it? Oh God, we have so many messages, so many texts, Instagram messages, posts on Instagram. We were ecstatic about it and so excited about it. Um, she was ready to see the mountains again. She told me time and time again, everyone else as well. She's not a city girl. She never was. She was ready to come home. What can you say uh, about the relationship with, with her ex? Uh, I mean, did you ever suspect that, that he could be this violent? I had a feeling, but I don't think I seriously ever suspected anything because I did not have the misfortune or fortune of meeting him in person. I only met him through FaceTime. I didn't understand, I didn't know. Yeah, and she would obviously talk a lot uh, on social media about what was going on, but did she confide in you also about, uh, about him? She did, she told me everything about how they were, how he controlled her, how he tried to manipulate her, or did manipulate her in many ways, socially, personally, how she dressed, who she saw, what she did, what she was doing for her career. So she did confide in me. Um, I wish I'd seen it. Yeah, it sounds like she had a very, very bright future ahead of her. Um, Gabriella, how did you find out what happened? I, I found out, um, I found out on the train. Uh, I had flown up to Chicago to, she'd bought my ticket. I was flying up there to bring her home and I hadn't heard from her all day, but got off the plane and I remember her saying something about the blue line. I have no idea what that means. I've never been to Chicago. So I got on the train and uh, ferociously tried to figure out where her, what her address was. Asked my friends like, hey, have you heard from her? Are my texts coming through? What are we doing? Um, asked her, I called her, no response. And um, I ultimately found out through Instagram and, uh, one of her friends told me, but I didn't really fully uh, accept it until uh, her dad called me in that, like while I was on the phone with the other friend and told me what happened. Oh um, my gosh. And, and you were like on your way there, uh, literally already was, made it to Chicago. Yeah, I was in Chicago on the train, mm -hmm. going to her house, expecting to have a night out with her. Yeah, yeah. What did her dad say? He was very calm, but he, he just told me the detail of the minimum of the details that she'd been shot in her apartment and asked me if I knew anything or if I was there yet or did I have Rahil's number or everyone is still trying to piece things together at that time. But that that was pretty much the entire conversation. Um, 
that her mother called me right afterward and uh, pretty much said the same thing, more distraughtly, but uh, I still was in shock and disbelief. I was on a train in the middle of a city yeah. I had no, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can't even imagine. Um, I want to read one of the messages that Sonia posted on TikTok, and there are a lot of them. Um, but this one said, going through a divorce as a South Asian woman feels like you failed at life sometimes. The way the community labels you, the lack of emotional support you receive, um, and the pressure to stay with someone because what will people say um, is, is isolating. Um, and you can see some of her messages right there. I mean, the thought that she felt pressured to stay and that it ended this way. It's just such a shame that 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 societal pressure existed. It is a shame and I think it's despicable and just completely crazy that it is even expected of these women especially in their circumstances, especially as vocal as they are, especially having supportive like progressive friends that they have and the direction that they were going. You know, I, I still cannot believe that it was my friend. I still cannot believe it was her out of all people. She was so bold and honest and open about what she was doing and ready to leave. It just, it's absolutely absurd. I, and I can't imagine other women who are not as fiery and fighting as she is. I can't imagine the, the future that they're expecting or they will meet. Yeah, and, and she was so close. I mean, you were there. You were so close to, to sort of rescuing her in a way. It's just <laughs> such a shame the way that it ended. Um, Gabriella, thank you so much. I, I know this can't be easy. We really appreciate you coming on tonight. Of course, happy night. Thanks, Okay, thanks. you got it. I want, I want to turn now to Dr. Uh, Michelle Gallietta. She is a clinical and, uh, and forensic psychologist. Um, Dr. Gallietta, I mean, you just heard from that friend. It's so heartbreaking, but to see the, almost the warning signs on TikTok, on social media, these women posted videos for so long, uh, you know, talking about what they were going through. It's just so disturbing. It, it is, you know, um, it's unacceptable and I think I don't know if people know how common it is, but a woman is beaten in our country every nine seconds. Um, and, and about a quarter of them require, are, are injured seriously enough to require medical attention. So it, it's, a, it's a more common thing than people know. Yeah, and in Dana's case, she had actually filed for divorce uh, and uh, was granted a hearing just last month. She even celebrated on social media. Again, she was documenting everything on her journey. Uh, I wanna show you this one video she posted. Hi everybody, I'm Dana Alatavi and um, yeah guys, oh my God. This is gonna be my getting divorced mukbang, woo! I went to the courthouse here in Kapolei and I wanted to get court paperwork for Brian to, for my husband Brian to, you know, have to appear in court because me and him are trying to get a divorce. It hasn't been working out. We're not coming to an agreement. Well, he doesn't want to come to an agreement. I do. Dr. Galliata, you have to wonder, like, if her ex was watching that video, is that just sort of fueling his anger? You know, it certainly it certainly could. And I think what you have to understand is that this generation of people, they share their lives on on TikTok and, and that's the way that people kind of communicate with their friends and express themselves. So, um, you know, and it may not be that that was the thing. I mean, people, domestic violence perpetrators stalk people and will find information no matter where it is. Did it make it a little bit easier? You know, perhaps. Um, but the interesting thing is, you know, she, as far as I know, she did not have an order of protection. And so I think one of the things that can be helpful is to have an order of protection. So the research is a little mixed on it, but what it allows you to do is if someone even calls you or makes contact and they're not allowed um, to have them arrested. Yeah, and I don't want to victim blame at all, obviously. And people use social media as an outlet, almost as a therapy in a way, like, like these women seem exactly. to be talking to people out there who are going through similar problems. But again, you do have to wonder, posting those videos, if you've got an unstable ex, um, it, it might push things over the edge. Um, you know, it's a double-edged sword because 
people get support from the internet. Um, but they also, I, I am certain that those women got terrible backlash from what they posted as well. The nasty, horrible things that other people watching um, would have posted. So it's kind of like even, you know, what you yeah. get, uh, get some support, you get some, some um, really nasty, nasty and, and um, horrible comments. And, and then there's the kind of piece about providing information and just not so much the just the information about whereabouts, but the kind of aggravating, right? So most domestic violence perpetrators, um, they seek control. They actually have low self-esteem and are many of them quite dependent. And so the idea that this is kind of public humiliation is is very problematic for a lot of those those perpetrators. Yeah, it's just so awful. And again, you see in the videos how vibrant these women were and they just had such a life to live and, and to see it end this way is just tragic. Uh, Dr. Michelle Gallietta, uh, thank you so much for coming on tonight. Thank you. Okay, anyone affected by abuse and in need of support can contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline. It's 1-800-799-7233. Advocates are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.